All right, guys, so this is going to be a pretty messy video, but I get this question quite a bit. How do you create a good, optimized, low-poly game mesh, right? And this question's kind of a loaded question. There's a lot that's involved with it, and it gets kind of complicated very fast because this has everything to do with the fundamentals of topology, working with 3D models, realizing that they triangulate at the end of the day, and it also has a big thing to do with uh, UV maps, right? But on top of that, you might be working a high res mesh to a lower state, perhaps. You might be doing a high poly that bakes to a lower poly. And then you might have to create LOD models. So you might have like a LOD 0, LOD 1, LOD 2, so on and so forth. Uh, but you might be taking a low poly model and turn it into a higher poly model using trim sheets and things like that. And so it gets really complicated. On top of that, it depends on the project you're working on. So if you're working on something for like low spec mobile, it's going to be made entirely lower detail than you probably imagine. Uh, it's going to be like working on a Nintendo 64 game. No joke. Uh, however, if you're doing something like Unreal Engine 5 with Nanite, you could go absolutely crazy with triangle count. It wouldn't really matter um, because of the Nanite system for the most part. So there's a big gap there in between, and that's it's going to depend on the project and what you're doing. The type of game that you might be working on as well comes into play. If it's a first-person shooter, things might be done one way. Third-person action adventure, they might be even a little bit lower quality perhaps. Uh, but if you're doing like real-time strategy stuff, you, you know, you have thousands of characters battling it out and your props in the scene, they may not have to be very detailed at all. It depends on the, uh, the situation there. But we're going to talk about a few things in this one that relates to all that. Uh, so we're going to get started with uh, bevel segments first. This is a huge one, I think. When you bevel an edge... You need to bevel with different numbers of segments here. So three edges or two segments will give us a center edge like this. This usually ends up being a seam a lot of times. So you might be able to do something like this, right? And so when you bevel, it's just like working with a cylinder for the most part. You're going to want to do something like two, four, or eight, or even higher. You might go to like 16, 32. These are just good numbers to utilize, potentially. Depending on how big your object is, you might need to use even higher. You, you know, it could go up to 64, who knows? And so you want to use these numbers though, because generally speaking, you're going to have a center seam, right? A lot of times you will, anyways. And when you do it that way, you can select every other edge, right? And you could do reductions. So now if you hit control X, you can dissolve it. So the way this works out is when you're creating LOD models later on and you're going to do a reduction, then you might do another reduction, right? It starts to do this number. So you'll have LOD 0, LOD 1, LOD 2, right? Right. So this is where Mesh Machine comes in handy because you can just unbevel things, right? Now, this also works on corners like this. So you would have your seams. Control E, mark seams if you want. You could select these ones nearest and then select the outer ones here and dissolve. See? And that process repeats. So we can do reductions that way. All right. Now, something that's kind of unfair to you guys is that you didn't grow up with the industry. You didn't have to do UV mapping the old school ways. So you probably didn't spend as much time on low poly models as a lot of other game artists that are out there, especially the professionals. They've been doing this for 20 years or so, and I've been doing it for about 22. Uh, the UV mapping system back in the day was just was pretty rough. Let's just put it that way. You usually had to box map things and then stitch it all back together or manually lay things out. Now you can just put seams and press U unwrap and it's mostly good. But one of the benefits of not having all these tools that you might have today is that you had to work with things manually. And so you ended up understanding a lot of, a lot of different little uh, intricate things about creating low poly meshes because it was all diffuse workflow. It wasn't high to, high to low bakes yet or anything. And um, so you took image textures and you try to use those to the best of your ability. Some of you guys probably have seen Ian Hubbard's videos where he's doing a lot of 
images to models, right? It's just using the textures and modeling off of them. You can still do that, and it's great practice to do that. Um, so a couple little tricks here with this first. is There's a lot of little tricks with it, but um, first up, keep uh, face attributes when you're in edit mode or correct face attributes, and keep connected, okay? Big one here, because if you now move a vertex, you'll see, or even a face, it tries to preserve the UV map. That's what it's going to end up doing, all right? Next up, Blender does not have a face constraint mode. Max and Maya have one. Blender, no, I don't know why. Uh, if you get the machine tools add on, it has something called surface slide in the modes pie. Usually modes pie is the tab key. It's enabled by default, I think, in machine tools. So uh, when you are in edit mode, you hit tab, you look at the modes pie, you'll find a surface slide feature. You have to toggle it on and off. So uh, I have a shortcut for it that I've set up. It's a little bit different. So you'd hit tab, go to the modes pie, look for surface slide, toggle it on. And um, when you're done using it, you toggle it off, right? Back in the modes pie. Uh, what this does is it adds something like a temporary shrink wrap, basically. And so you can actually move these vertices around without coming off of the surface basically, right? And this doesn't always get it perfect, but it tries its best to preserve uh, the things going on here. Now you notice that the texture is kind of moving around while I do this. This is because of the triangulation and the way UV maps work in general. In order to keep textures displayed correctly, uh, you need to add more geo usually. That's just how it is. There is some inaccuracies in them. So don't be alarmed when things kind of fluctuate around like this a little bit. It does, it does happen, all right? Uh, but that's super useful because if you ever have like an edge kind of in the wrong area a little bit, uh, you can kind of tweak it and position it a little bit different perhaps. Like maybe maybe we want to follow this edge out here, right? So we can maybe move this one down a little. And we can do that and we won't mess up our, um, our UV for the most part. You can see we can kind of do that all the way through now. Um, as needed. I'm going to turn off surface slide. I'm going to press K. Use the knife tool. All right. Maybe I want to send this out to the bottom down here somehow. You can just do some knife cuts. And if you merge, you take one and you try to merge it to the other, it'll distort. You have to GG twice and slide it. Okay. You could do it that way. Or you could turn on vertex snapping up here. Turn on auto merge. Make sure the correct face attributes is on. Press G and snap them. You can also do that. Okay. So in this case, I want to turn on surface slide. Turn snapping off a second. I want to line these up like this. So it's like a square corner. I can take this vertex, hit control B and V. And I can bevel a vertex as well. I'm going to hit C. And it turns off my clamping. You guys shouldn't have that on by default. But you can see I can start to do things like this as well and um, work with this geo still and try to make it do what I want it to do. So if I take all that and control X and dissolve it, maybe vertex snap this down, you see? We can start to control this mesh in this manner where we can do things like this anyways. Uh, so we can move things around, merge them, slide them, and so certain things will not distort the UVs too bad. Like doing things like that, for example. Or maybe we want to do some knife cuts and we'll cut like a shape here. You see how this is kind of a distorted UV right now? As soon as I add a little bit more geo, this will probably kind of do a little pop and jump back into place. All right, you see? Now everything's distorted again, right? I don't think I turned surface slide off on the other one. Yeah, it's still on over here, I guess. All right, let's go back. You got to turn it off. I'm going to turn it on over here. I was thinking that might cause a problem with it, but... Yeah, so you can see we can kind of tweak things, adjust things in this manner. Very easy to do after you get used to it. Now, this one, I'm going to turn surface slide off. We can inset and hold control, and we can push it up. So you can also distort your UVs a little bit, and it won't be the end of the world if you do that. Keep in mind when you're distorting the UVs, a lot of times you're going to want to turn correct face attributes off, okay? Because they could cause a good bit of problems when you're pushing things in and out, potentially. Uh, also, when you're moving your mesh into edit mode, if you had that on, you're going to really screw up your, uh, 
your UVs there. So turn that off when you don't need it and uh, just use it as needed. But this is good, good to understand how to do this kind of stuff. And even better is that as you do it more, you'll start to realize there's certain times that the things that you think you would do to optimize the mesh causes too much problems, basically. You see, like, the UVs just go crazy here with this one, even if this is on. Um, it might still just go a little bit too crazy, creating too narrow of an edge, perhaps. Uh, stuff like that can come into play. And it's really kind of bizarre because you don't always know exactly when it's going to do it, maybe, um, or how you might fix it. Sometimes you have to do just an additional knife cut, make another triangle somewhere, something like that. And you'll have to play around with it and get the hang of it, all right? So first, you know, learn to create low poly models and control the UVs and work with these meshes where you're not destroying them. This is the key to optimization because you're more than likely, you're going to create a high poly. You're going to probably work it into a lower poly state that might be like your LOD zero. Good odd chance you do that. Or you create a LOD zero mesh around your high poly. And then you're going to have to reduce it even further later on to create LOD one, LOD two. And you got to go as low as you got to go. And so you're trying to hit triangle counts a lot of times. And everybody asks constantly, I see this everywhere where, Someone's asking, you know, what's the triangle count I should have for a weapon or a car or this or that? I can't tell you for sure, because if you're doing something for mobile, it's completely different than, you know, like AAA, Unreal Engine 5 stuff. Uh, however, there's, this gets into more game development area. Like if you're actually programming the game and you can test these things as you're working on your project to figure out what you want to afford as a budget, maybe to weapons or to vehicles. If you want more detail for your vehicles, you might sacrifice detail on something else like props in the environment, you know? So there's like a balance there that can be made that if you're not doing the development side of thing, you probably won't probably won't be able to um, come up with a realistic number there more than likely, especially since you got to test it for the most part. That's the big part of it. Uh, you definitely want to test things out and see what's working and what's not working. And you want to have kind of a vertical slice done of a project anyways, where you're working on maybe just a, like a really detailed part of the game where it's they're going to be the most complex, perhaps. So like that should be like kind of the, what the starting point for like some of the art it, where you're just pushing the limits of everything to their max and just testing everything off the bat just to, to see if you can get it um, working and measured basically so that way when you're building out the rest of this stuff hopefully you don't run into as many issues and you're probably still gonna run into issues but anyways that's just my thoughts on that so uh learn to work with low poly models do this here have fun with it i mean you can you can download textures from texture.ninja this is what this is right here it's just free textures that you can use uh, textures.com has plenty like that as well and but that's doing kind of like the low poly first right that's something you might do for a lot of environment art when you're doing trim sheets, obviously. And if you just want to poke some details out instead of displacing the whole thing with tessellation or whatever, you might do stuff like that. All right. Now, you might be doing high polys to low polys. All right. Your high polys are super important. You need to spend some time just learning to model high poly models. Even if you're going to, like, you need to understand this because you can still high poly model trim sheets or. Uh, do seamless textures or whatever. You can model those kinds of things if you wanted to. And it's important to understand that you could do the highest poly model and bake it back down to a plane, right? So where you go from your high poly model back down to a plane is really up to you. Like if this was a, uh, a tree model, for example, it could turn into a sprite in the background, you know, like a little 2D plane card. And that's the crazy thing about games is they're super optimized in a lot of ways. So I can't tell you for sure like how optimized you need to get with your projects. Uh, if you're doing portfolio stuff though, you just do like a, a modest optimization just to show that you know what you're doing and, and reduction and whatnot. Um, but it's it's up to you ultimately. Like, do you like how far low do you want to go? That's that's really the question, right? And just as an example here, uh, someone asked me this one day. By the way, they were like, you know, can you? 
create a high poly model and then bake it to a low poly model with textures and everything? The answer is yes. That's exactly what happened right here, actually. And um, you can do that and you can still get relatively good results out of it. Like up close, obviously, this isn't going to win any awards or nothing. But if you're doing something like mobile assets or something, you need to, uh, for whatever reason, model the high and then bake it to a low. I mean, you could do that potentially, right? But that's the differences between the, um, the detail levels here. Like this might be a good prop in um, a certain game, maybe, but you know, if you're doing like a loading menu screen or like a customization screen for customizing vehicles or whatever, and you have to have spray paint can that's like on a desk next to whatever the menu items, which is what this is supposed to be for, you're probably going to want to have it pretty clear. You know, you're going to want to make sure you check those silhouettes. And uh, it's it's nice and crisp and good looks good. Whereas if this was just some prop in a background in the garage, you know, <laughs> just throw something like that up there. Uh, and if it's 20 feet away and nobody gets close to it, then yeah, it might work out like that, right? Nobody's going to care. You probably don't even need to make a high poly for it like this. Uh, you could probably just texture half of it. But And there's guys that do that, by the way. You could just hand paint a height map and convert it into a normal map. And the normal map can generate a curvature map and an ambient occlusion map and all kinds of other fun stuff. So there's guys that work that way where they do low poly, hand paint a height, and then they go around and texture it all by hand, basically. You can do it in substance. You can do it in Blender. It's um, it's a cool workflow, but ultimately you have to determine your um, silhouette. Like how much detail of that do you need to preserve? Like how much of the model uh, really needs those extra faces? If you're, if you're working any kind of game model, like if you can reduce, then and it doesn't affect the uh, overall fidelity of the model for the game, like it matches all of the other models in the game, then reduce, you know? Start, start knocking things out. If you don't need them, you don't need them, right? So if you don't need a subdivision on it, you know, just get rid of the subdivision. In this case, I'm going to have only one issue, and that is this is not fully finished with UV maps everywhere, but I have seams and you don't want to dissolve seams usually. So this label here is a seam. So you see, if you dissolve a seam, it doesn't like it. Usually you don't want to get rid of those kind of hard points. You know, you don't want to touch too much. Not saying you can't, but it's probably going to distort the heck out of your, um, your UV, right? So, that's a possibility that you do dissolve it at some point when you're doing really distant LOD models, you know, like if this thing, you know, you want it something more like this and then it LODs like this at level, I don't know, like it's like LOD number four or something. It's like way back here. You would never, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like if that was, you couldn't tell the difference between those for the most part, if it was that far away. So not a big deal. If you want to reduce this and get rid of seams, you probably could, could even mess up the label and all that. Probably wouldn't matter. You could take this down to basically a cube if you wanted to, you know? You really could. Or even um, what looks like there's something you would do for mobile. I'm going to mention this real quick. A lot of times you don't have the budget for cylinders in mobile. So you'll use triangles like this. And then you would shade them basically smooth and maybe mark sharp the top and the bottom shade it auto smooth set it to 180 there you go okay so it's not going to be a, a perfect cylinder but it gives the impression it's kind of like a cylinder you know and so you know how far do you got to reduce right what is your reduction amount what kind of game are you making how close is it to the camera all these questions come into play i can't answer all of them for you but you definitely can start to balance it out. That's what I'm saying. Uh, creating one one object. I think this is where a lot of guys go wrong. They're creating one prop. They're like, you know, I'm creating a prop. Okay. And you want to make it the best you can. So you make a super high poly model. And then you're like, well, what do I do with this low poly model? Right? Well, get a game engine. Right? I'm going to tell you what you should do. Uh, download Unreal Engine. In particular, this is probably the better one for it. But uh, you could try Unity or a cry engine even but download any game engine and usually you can find 
uh, example scenes or sets or maps. I don't care which engine it is. Just find one that meets the quality that you're trying to hit, right? Are you trying to do like that kind of like current, maybe last generation kind of look? Or are we going back to like 2000, you know, like, are you trying to hit that diffuse workflow on Xbox? So, you know, pick an environment that you can find or props or anything that are similar to the kind of quality that you want to create and just start mimicking that if you would, like the density of the mesh, how many bevel segments it has. Just pay particular attention to things like that, and it's going to help you out tremendously, especially if it's a full-on environment. And when you go to the Epic, um, the Unreal Engine Marketplace, right, they give away free assets all the time. You can get full-on environments that are set up AAA quality. Uh, some of them are even better than, I would say, like Cyberpunk's quality. And um, it it looks great, right? So... You can compare and contrast. You could load up one of those scenes and start building your own props to throw into that scene and see if you can match their style and their quality level. That's probably the better way of doing it is to treat it more like you're modifying a video game as opposed to creating a brand new video game asset all on your own. You know, just go in there and just throw your stuff in there and see how it looks next to their stuff. And um, it'll help you out quite a bit because, you know, this would look like garbage compared to some of the Unreal Engine stuff out there, right? This one might might be able to hang with some of them. So, But it definitely needs to be maybe optimized if you're not going to use Nanite. And even using Nanite, you want to optimize it a little bit. So, But there's all kinds of stuff in here I can get rid of. Uh, I can still do things like weight the, weight the normals, even though it's mostly a pretty dense mesh. These kinds of things in here, you can dissolve those, if you didn't know that. You just... Control number pad plus more dissolve to start working it back. And that's what's great about quads is that they're really easy to just select and uh, work with, basically. Whereas if you're using a lot of ingons and stuff, it's not that they're impossible to, um, to optimize. It's actually kind of simple, believe it or not. We can even go to, say, this one over here. Let's see if we got enough mesh in here to do it. Um, a lot of times you can do it like a limited dissolve and type in 0 0.05. And a lot of times that works out really well. But the only issue you can see here, we lost some some edges that were helping that hold into place. And that happens to be an edge that's a seam. So that would do that, right? Not maybe the best example of a mesh, but um, when you have a bunch of like triangles and stuff on a big flat surface, they'll usually dissolve away. And you go ahead and you just hit X, excuse me, you're going to hit, I'm trying to build it. I was wanting to build it. I was deciding whether I was going to or not. Uh, yeah, we're going to do it, I guess. All right. So like you have some crazy stuff like this going on that you've modeled. It's like a high poly model and all kinds of nonsense going on in here. I'm just going to model it real quick. It's all flat, right? This is why N-Gons and triangles work well well ingons in particular are good as, as flat anyways so you do something like this and you're like i want to optimize this a x l limit dissolve type in 0 0.05 try not to do this on cylinders but on big ingons like this it might be useful and the reason i say don't do it on cylinders is because if we do it on this it's going to turn all of these into big ingons down here or like this will become a big end gun and even really small little edges will become end guns and you don't want that because then it's almost impossible to repair it it's not that good right anyway so all right that's um it's kind of the whole video i guess in, in a nutshell it's um practice with the the topology the the subdivision or excuse me practice with you know, merging things, practice with uh, using correct face attributes and surface slide. Um, try breaking things down to triangles or doing like three to one reductions where you're making something that looks like an inset. There's, there's different little things like that that you could definitely do. This mesh maybe isn't the best example of it. I'll probably try a three to one over here. Let's see. Yeah, we'll do a three to one real quick just so you guys know what I'm talking about. Cut one of these in half and you go in the direction you want to reduce right 
And normally, these edges, you can reduce them. You see? Probably can reduce that one too. Probably target weld that one back up here. All right. So you can do reductions like that where it looks like an inset, or you can use triangles. I mean, at the end of the day, your mesh is going to be triangulated in Game Engine. So if you want to use triangles, use triangles. It's, it's fun. Um, as long as it doesn't distort the UVs too bad, it doesn't mess up the shading too bad. So do go to solid view and, um, you know, check out your shading time to time. Make sure you're not destroying that. Uh, it could be quite useful as well. So, you know, shade things smooth, merge them by distance if needed. Got bad shading down here. I don't know because it shouldn't be. Oh, you know what? I think that's a shadow. Actually. Yeah. We rotate it. Will it go away? Yeah. So that's uh, something like a termination ray, if you would. And the light source casts a ray out. It sometimes dies. It just happens to die across this triangle. Right. If it was higher poly, it wouldn't do that. Okay. So... Well, it wouldn't be as noticeable when it does it. All right. Anyways, that's pretty much it for this video. Just kind of give you some tips there on all this. And it, so one thing I want to mention about the bake here, though. Some of you guys, are, I know some some of you are ready to ask this. Like, how do, can you bake this? Like, this still looks okay, even though it's six cylinders, six-sided cylinder. But how do you bake this to a six-sided cylinder, right? I know some of you guys were wondering. So we'll take a look at it real quick. First. High poly first, right? We already saw that. You want to do your high poly? And you do your low poly. In my case, I made a six-sided cylinder that basically surrounds it. Here's a trick about your low poly. It doesn't have to be optimized. It needs to sometimes have additional edge loops where you can control the direction of the cage, okay? Or the ray cast. Cages, or when you're baking... A high poly to a low poly, you're basically doing a bunch of ray casts. That's what you're doing. So um, you might need some additional edges to control that. You can create those cuts to prevent skewing of the textures, but also correct the issues you have on like cylinders and things like that, right? So uh, if we look real quick, we have the high, we have the low. They're basically intersecting each other. This is fine. It's not really a big deal. Used to be a big deal, I think, back in the day, if I remember correctly, but it's not. It's not anymore. So uh, what's most important is that you have a cage model. And what I do is I give it a material and under viewport display, I just assign it some color and then drop the alpha. It becomes semi-transparent. Uh, make sure it's set to material up here if you need to. And so we'll have the high, the low, and the cage needs to basically encompass all of it, right? That's all it needs to occur. And so I don't think it even needs to encompass the high all the way, I think. I think it's just the low it needs to encompass totally. But I'm probably going to eat my words on that one. So just cover everything. Why not? All right. With that out of the way, though, where a lot of you guys go wrong with baking, and the reason you have such an issue with this is because you don't understand what it's doing necessarily. And so we have this cage vertex, and we have the low poly vertex, which is hiding underneath back here. So let me take both of them into edit mode, actually. Okay. So this vertex and this vertex, this is going to shoot a ray towards that vertex. That's the direction it's going. So it's like lining these two up, like that's the barrel of a gun, right? And it's going right through there. Okay. Now every vertex is going to do that with the other vertex. And everywhere between those, it's going to be interpolated or whatever, right? It's going to do more cast something like that okay so when you're using no cage it's the equivalent of just inflating your mesh it's like doing something like this maybe it's even doing it even like okay which is great and all if for very curvy stuff that's smooth shaded and all kinds of other stuff fun stuff anyways but for these uh hard edges here from blender it doesn't work out too well especially on cylinders this doesn't work out too well you'll want a cage now Usually on cylinders, you want to try to keep these edges here for the cage model anyways. We'll do just the cage for a second. You want to try to keep these right above that surface, the top of the cylinder piece that you're baking to. 
and you want to pull them out a little bit extra far. So you'd probably grab like this whole loop around here. We're going to talk about why it's triangulated here in a second. I'll press L. And I'm going to select by seam. And so I'm going to use my seams in my cage <laughs> to control it. I'm going to press S and shift Z. And you can see you can pull it out in that direction, right? So you can pull them in and out on only the one direction or the two directions. And prevent it from going up and down. This prevents it from going higher, where this is going to start to interpolate rays going at this flat edge, basically, from the top, right? That's what's going to cause a lot of those saw patterns or weird edges and all kinds of other fun stuff. So instead, you want it to shoot from the side and try to hit right here on the high poly model, right? And you'll want this one to do that same thing and so on and so forth. So you do, and then that ends up working out a lot better. But sometimes you might have weird issues like I had here. I had to add an extra loop so I could shoot the rays a little bit more down and at an angle like that. And, um, so all these are interpolated in between there. It still didn't come out right, but it was pretty close anyways. So it mostly works out. You can see here at the top, just a little slight rise to it. I probably could have brought it lower, and um, but mostly from out from the side. And that's going to keep the, keep that bacon towards that side, right? So this is what's important, right? We have the cage. This is the direction it's shooting. This vertex here, is shooting to, let's see if we can view it, shooting to this vertex here. It's pointed right there, right? And it's going to go up, and for the most part, these rays are all going to shoot right down the middle. And subsequently, every other ray throughout this whole area would be shooting about right down the middle of this thing. So even though we have this huge hole here, they're all hitting right here, right? It's picking up data from right in this area. Now, it didn't get perfect. It, it definitely did not get it perfect. But you can see on that low poly when we bring it back that we don't have ray misses. But it's exactly, it's baked from that, right? So that's why that occurs in that manner. And um, you can see there's some other goofy stuff going on here. I didn't get everything perfect. There's a little bit of like um, up and down motion going on that little saw pattern or like a little bit of warping a, a lot of this can be fixed by just stretching the um the cage mesh out further and it projects more from the side in like an orthographic view instead of like a perspective view almost and uh kills off the the skewing basically if you do that so if you ever want to try that do that just scale it out more on um, x and y not don't not z uh, but other than that the um The other issue I had was, this is almost one you'll always run into. If you bake at a low resolution with no anti-aliasing, it's probably not going to look that good. All right, so bake with uh, higher resolution, use anti-aliasing, and a lot of the little artifacts you have on edges, a lot of times they clean up and they go away. It's not usually a big deal. Um, on top of that, if you're going to bake in Blender, listen, use the text tools add-on. But something I just realized the other day about it, you need to set your baking device to GPU or it doesn't use GPU. In image depth, you might want to change the 32-bit. All right? Uh, it doesn't handle that 8-bit very well. So for whatever reason, that's just what it is. But um, it's a little bit weird using it as a baker if you're coming from other software. There's also an add-on called Simple Bake, which is really awesome. But um, I actually kind of like the text tool setup. I think it's kind of nice. You just kind of do one at a time and, uh, you know, tweak it and get it right and whatnot. So that's what I did. I baked literally using text tools right here. To, so that's how that worked out. All right. Oh, let's do, um, let's do this one real quick. Let's press L, shift H, hide everything else. We want to reduce these here. You can control shift, click these and it'll select a ring. Or you can do select one and then do select loops rings like so. You want to do a checker deselect. And you can do select. Um, you can do select loops, edge loops. And it'll select all the way up to the top like this. Every other one 
when you do this select loops or check or deselect excuse me although we're not going to be able to get back to it if you accidentally select your seam and you dissolve it it's going to mess up your uvs so when you check or deselect just offset it all right there's a little offset button in there but this will let you control x you can reduce the cylinder you can do this again to take it down even further if you wanted to uh, this particular cylinder we have a quad fill down here at the bottom and um you know this still works with it technically so it's not really a big deal but sometimes it might not just remember when you're doing mesh like this sometimes you have to rebuild it at random times so if you were to take something like this and control exit and just dissolve it not a big deal your uv should be fine still you probably could go back through here uh, press i and inset it and i and inset it again and maybe even leave an end gun if you wanted probably wouldn't hurt it out hurt it too much you can see it basically doing the same thing as long as it's not a subdivision mesh or whatever probably not too big of a deal you can also try reducing all of these in here as well if you wanted to leave that up to you though and let's see about this one okay i said i was going to explain why it's triangulated well i'm going to talk about this real quick i'll just show you anyways and then we'll end the video uh, so first the we'll worry about the high we'll worry about the cage and the low all right your low poly mesh before you bake it with text tools or you go to other bakers even sometimes uh, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go ahead and probably weight the normal and usually setting this at 100 works pretty well but sometimes it doesn't give you the exact results you want you might leave it at 50 use face influence you can modify your normals by selecting a face all in setting face strength so all in set face strength strong weak medium or whatever um, and that'll take effect on that usually your bigger faces you just set it to strong it'll get pretty close to making it the equal to setting it to one here but you won't mess up all of the uh, shading perhaps across the whole model where it doesn't look right or whatever all right so just remember you can use face influence then you triangulate it you keep your normals use shortest diagonal it usually works out well okay so triangulate shortest diagonals and you some people set this to five i wouldn't do that just keep it at four it's fun uh, next up this is going to be your low poly cage or excuse me it's going to turn into your cage mesh basically you duplicate it and name it cage and give it the material or whatever you want um, the cage you apply everything okay so when you're looking at the cage here you could literally just after you duplicate the mesh you could just uh, right click on it convert it to a mesh and that'll be your cage mesh it's triangulated and so you have to select things with l and using seams usually works out best it's just a little tip there for you now why because all 3d models here in blender and he's going to have uh, a vertex order so you can see under geometry nodes when we select any mesh you have a bunch of vertices here listed right and this is in order zero through 41 in this case and if these become out of order you'll run into issues right and the problem with um low polys and blender at least that i've been having anyways is you'll see that sometimes i don't know if we can get this one to do it when you inflate them yeah it's already doing it you see the triangles spinning out of control okay for whatever reason that messes up the vertex order at least that's what text tools is saying that's what it says is vertex orders are messed up uh, and it's a problem right here inside of uh here inside of blender anyways and i believe some well some of the other bakers might suffer from that too i've never had a problem in substance with it but i don't know so just keep that in mind you might want to do that or at least if you're running into a problem where it says vertex order is out of sync or something um, now you know how to fix it at least you just apply the triangulate to the cage and it should work uh, in other software and you know export out a triangulated model to other software as well for the low poly and it should work out fun but um yeah that's pretty much it i just want to go ahead and that's all i wanted to do i wanted to talk about this for a bit figured some of you would love to know this kind of stuff so 
we'll leave this video here. And I hope you enjoyed. All right, I'll check you out in the next one.